Hi, and welcome to the Sarah Swallows News Desk, where we talk all things Sarah Swallow and the Tour Divide. This program is brought to you by Jams Distribution, an umbrella company for the Super Jambo Grand Prix, JTV, the Jam Ambassador Scholarship Program, and Jambi Jambi Incorporated. Jams Distribution, distributing happiness. I'm your host, Jambi Jambi, and today's guest is someone that has paid a rather integral part in this show. While the team behind the scenes at Sarah Swallow's News Desk have worked around the clock bringing you the latest on world topics and hot goss, we would not be able to run this tight ship without our guest. We've all watched for 21 days, four hours and 10 minutes, the double S icon shimmering its way down the 2,479 mile Great Divide route. Three days before the start of the 2001 Great Divide race, Sarah's bike rack carrying the bespoke specialized epic hardtail snapped while riding while traveling at 60 miles per hour on the freeway and left the bike with a broken seat stay, broken handlebars and damage to her equipment. We watched her navigate this with calm composure online, but today we're going to ask the hard hitting questions to see if we can peel back that tanned and glowing skin of our guest to see what the hardest mountain bike race in the world really felt like. Welcome to the hot seat, Sarah J Swallow. <laughs> Welcome, Sarah. How Thank you. I feel really good. I feel great. It's great to be here. That's good. I like your hair. Thank <laughs> you. I like yours. I'm actually, I think I'm going to get my hair cut that length. Yeah, I think it suits me. Body. Suits us. It does suit us. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so some people are calling this the greatest second place finish in the <laughs> Great Divide history. What do you say to those comments? Oh, wow. That's such an honor. You know, it's great to be in second place. Um, you know, I had a really great time. And so, um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't work that hard. So I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> wow. I'm excited to place. that, actually. Um, so do you think... You know, in your opinion, was this the hardest thing that you'd done or did you expect it to be harder than it actually turned out to be? Yeah, you know, I think going into it, I was expecting the hardest thing I've ever done and coming out of it, I feel like it wasn't as hard as I expected. And, um, but it was plenty hard you know, but it wasn't like, I thought it was going to be hard in other ways that it wasn't, wasn't very hard. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of viewer questions that kind of touch on that topic too, that we might get to a little later. Um, I mean, there's with this kind of ride, I feel like there is so much that you could sort of dissect and you could talk about it for a really long time because people are interested in different aspects of the ride. Like for me, I think my like interest is in a lot of the sort of um, how do you keep mentally strong and how do you keep pushing when, when shit just gets really shit. Um, I think that's because I work on those sorts of things the most in my writing. So I'm kind of interested in it when other people are writing. Um, but, you know, I'm also interested in gear. And then there's like the environmentalists that are interested in like what the, you know, what kind of critters you saw and that sort of stuff. So what do you think in like when you're looking at somebody's ride, what are you most interested in? Yeah, you know, I think with the the a ride like the Great Divide or the or the the race like the Tour Divide, um, I think I'm interested in the mental challenge um, in in a lot of ways because like you're 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 dealing with like loneliness and then you're just dealing with riding so many miles like every day for three weeks and um and just like how you mentally get through like those tough 
tough time. So that was like kind of what I was like really focused on going into this. And what I'm always like interested in when, um, when I, when I hear about people's experiences out there, just like how they get through it. So, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. What was, what was the most interesting thing about this ride? Like in those categories, like the environment, your gear and how it performed or like how your head performed, how your body performed. (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah, I think there's like interesting aspects of, of each one. I, yeah, I think like, um, gosh, like the physical thing was, uh, there are a lot of like physical things that were, um, challenges for me and, and interesting challenges for me, like dealing with, um, like riding in one chamois every single day. Like that was an interesting thing that I didn't really expect to be dealing with. Like, I thought I wasn't going to wear the chamois, but then I was like, Oh yeah. After like 120 miles every day, I kind of need to wear a chamois. So, um, so that was an interesting thing. And, um, and then like, I thought that the way I made it through mentally was also really interesting. I thought the course was gorgeous and all the critters and that I saw were just amazing. You know, there are just some really magical experiences and like the weather, the storms that I was in was really, um, pretty spectacular and also like scary and adrenaline, like lots of adrenaline. So there's, there's all sorts of, and then my like gear, my bike breaking at the beginning, like before it even started three days before the race started, my bike flew off my bike rack going 60 miles an hour and um and the frame cracked and the whole bike was totally gnarled and I thought it was over and like I made a few calls and before I know it like I've got a carbon builder in Bozeman Montana I'm going to repair my carbon bike um, within like 12 hours and uh, the ultra cycles um building it back up stripping it down building it back up and so I was able to make it and then my handlebars breaking you know there's so many things that happened (laughs) do you think that like um maybe set a better tone for when you did finish because you'd already like had to go through something like that where you'd have to manage your own um you know like uh anxiety I guess of not being able to do it so you already like then you get to the start line you've already sort of started your race a couple of days ago I feel like it might have might have um dispersed some of the like I think you're right and honestly I haven't I haven't really thought about that like the whole time you know these last few days have just been like I feel great the whole time like you know I usually have like way more crises like during (laughs) during rides but like I think that I had my crisis before the ride started and it was so intense that it may have just like gotten all out of my system. Mm, I love that. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we might just jump into some questions. We put um, a couple of stories up on Instagram and we got some questions from people that have been following along. So um, we might just jump into a couple of those because it seems like we're starting to touch on, on those topics anyways. Um, so from Jeff's world, Abigail Mormon and Surly Blue Fox, they have a question about, um, like expectations going into the ride. Like what was the biggest over or underestimation of the trip? I guess, I guess I kind of, um, maybe I underestimated a little bit, like maybe I thought that the route was going to be more difficult. Like I could have, that, that definitely I think was a thing. Like I thought it was going to be a bit more difficult than it was. It was very rideable. The route is very rideable. There's a lot of there's, uh, always showed like really, I mean, possibly that's when you're videoing is when you're showing like sort of long, nice, like flowing gravel, not I mean I didn't see too much climbing and hiking a bike and that sort of stuff yeah 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 that there was there it was yeah it was all mostly I would say like 10 percent hike a bike maybe you know less than that maybe um yeah definitely less um but yeah like I you know like based on my goals like my goals were like 
20, my, my goal was 25, um, 25 days and my limit was 32 days. And that was all based off of rides that I normally do. And what I think I realized was just that like a lot of rides that I normally do are a lot more technical and I'm also not riding as many hours in a day. And so like the tour divide, like all you're doing every single day is, waking up and then riding and you don't have anything else to do that day. So like I just ended up getting in this routine of riding from, you know, five or not five, rarely five, but, um, you know, six to seven to um, eight to 10, you know, depending on where I was in the, in the country at the time. And so um, you can get a lot of, things done in that amount of time, a lot of distance covered. And when I'm bike touring, you know, I'm usually like leaving camp at 11 and finishing at five, you know? So it's like, I, I think that's where I was coming from with my, my goals and my limit numbers. So maybe that's a underestimation and overestimation. Yeah. Um, Did you find it hard to get set sail so early in the morning? Like I always, when I'm out touring, I'm always like, yeah, I'll, I'll leave camp early. And then suddenly it's like 9.30 already. I'm like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you in the beginning, adjust. yeah, like, well, so the first, I kind of got like really sent into it right away because the fir- the second day, you know, the first morning that we had, um, I woke up to like rain. It just had started raining. It was the first morning. And like my greatest fear, you know, was like being in my bivy in the pouring rain. And that's what I got the first morning. And so I was like immediately jumping out of my bag and packing up like, and so it started raining at 530. And that's what I, that's when I got up. And, um, but then like the days after that, it was difficult. Like, you know, I think I, I, those first like four days, I was probably like getting on my bike around seven or seven or eight or nine. Like I know in Butte, I don't think I left the hotel until like nine or 10. I was having a crisis in Butte, <laughs> a small one, one of the small ones. <laughs> in Butte. Um, well, Butte was um, at the Butte was the town at the end of like my first hardest day, and it was day four. And you know, I had ridden more distance like in four days um, than I ever have. Um, <laughs> and so, and it was a ride from essentially Helena to Butte, and um, it was like it was like 97 or like hundred degrees that day. And there wasn't very much shade. Uh, there was a really terrible, probably the worst hike a bike of the whole route was outside of Helena. So I did that. And that was when I was doing that pantsless because it was day four. I hadn't washed my chamois yet and I hadn't like figured that out. And so I washed my chamois in a Creek and um and then it was like wet and so i was like oh just dry it i'll wear it and i'll dry it'll dry while i'm climbing and it it wasn't drying fast enough like it was annoying and so by the time i got to the top of the climb into that hike a bike i had been by myself for all this time because i hadn't seen anyone since the first day so i just took the chamois off and i just did that whole hike a bike pantsless (laughs) and tried my chamois and when i was done the chamois was dry and my butt was dry, which was really important because I was like that day I was like this, you know, you're a, sh- uh, a saddle sore will end your trip on this kind of ride. And so I was like, I'm going to maintain my butt hygiene so I don't have to quit. I think there is a question in here Oh, from um, Corduroy Pantaloons. Um, yeah, it's like where and how did you take showers and how do you avoid saddle sores? I guess there's no one tactic. You just have to make it up as you go along or did you have a strategy? I did not have a strategy because I didn't think I was going to wear a chamois. So it was something that I had not prepared for at all. And I, you know, I've done chamois on tours like six years ago, but I don't, you know, I don't remember. I was just a different you know, body then. So, um, so I was really worried about it because I was like, this is gross and I don't know what to do. (laughs) And so, um, you know, what I did ahead of time, I, I brought tea tree oil. Um, so that, that was something. And then I, and then in Butte, I got some like natural, um, 
uh, baby diaper rash. And so this is, this is what I did. I just, I was like that day four in Butte, like everything on my body was hurting, but also my butt was like, it was getting bad. And so I was like, I have to do something. And so number one is like washing my chamois as much as I could. Like anytime I got a room, I always like tried to make sure I was getting a hotel that was, um, that had laundry or that there was laundry mat nearby. Um, I went to lots of laundry mats um, and just did did my laundry. And um, so keeping the chamois as clean as possible. Um, and then, you know, my nightly routine was to use like baby wipes and I would wipe myself down and then I would put tea tree oil on like all the hot spots. And then I would put this like baby diaper rash cream on and my butt was like so clear and good the entire time. And um, it only at the very end when I was just like soaking wet for like four days straight was I starting to develop some issues, but I finished before it really became an issue. But, um, but yeah, that was my routine. And uh, yeah, I just, there got in creeks a lot. Like I would get in creeks if I felt gross, you know, um, I bathed in a creek bathed in creeks. And like I said, I would get, I got some rooms and mm -hmm. took showers and um, yeah. I mean, I would like to just see like chamois um, use more natural materials like merino wool with them. Like, I think that that, um, you know, it might not be as soft, but it will be a lot more like hygienic. Um, mm -hmm. So just using more like antimicrobial materials, yeah. I think would be nice. Like the actual chamois. I know that they make like wool shorts or whatever, but, um, you know, cause I can wear wool underwear a lot longer than, uh, padded. Yeah. Chamois. Okay. So we've got some questions about fear. What was scary and how did you combat the fear? Um, did you have any fear? Um, I think my fear, I think my fear manifested, um, in like Southern Colorado headed towards the highest pass, Indiana pass. Um, and just like really scared of the weather. Like it had just started to just rain every day. And there were some pretty intense storms, um, during the day. And I was approaching Indiana pass and I was just like, scared that that was going to be like that at 11,500 feet after I'm already traumatized by that pass from when I hike a biked like 12 miles through the snow up there and um camp you know got you know took refuge in Elwood cabin um so I was a little like thinking that it was going to be that intense of an experience only like rain and thunder and lightning and just like you know, just really intense, but you know, I just kept going and it wasn't that bad. It wasn't even raining at the top. It was like sunny and beautiful. And then on the other side, it got, it got rainy and, and thundery, but, um, but there was like a, a shelter. So it wasn't even a thing, you no. know, it was just kind of something I was building up going into it. So would you say your tip is to just do it anyways? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I learned was like early on when it first started raining, like, so I, I essentially got rain, um, every single day, rain and thunderstorms every single day, um, at, like from Salida on. And, um, so within those first couple of days, as I was like coming to terms with the, the weather forecast and my lack of preparation for, you know, riding in, and camping in the rain every single day. Um, I was just really consumed by the weather forecast and I was like letting it kind of, it was influencing me um, and how I was feeling about the ride. And it was actually one of like kind of the challenges, the one of the bigger challenges of my ride was, you know, from Del Norte to, um, I guess like just after Del Norte, it was kind of just intimidating to me. And then, um, but then I just, I just kept going and, and then I stopped w looking at the weather and everything became okay. I was still in the storms, but like I was actually enjoying myself and just, 
being in it rather than being worried about being in it. Yeah, I definitely feel like if you're leading up to a tour or something like that, looking at the weather is a bad idea. Obviously, you have to do it a little bit. You have to get it gauged, like, you know, what kind of tents you're looking at. But it just, yeah. like, I don't know why. I guess it's, like, kind of ingrained in, in like, just being a human being and being concerned about the weather. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it really does. It's, like, one of the biggest mental plays, I reckon. I would yeah. just say to stop looking at the weather. <laughs> And, you know, I was actually thinking about our trip um, that one time when we were, when like the, everybody abandoned and we were going in and in, into the, the, the snowstorm and like how much buildup there was with that, <laughs> you know, like we lost like eight people out of our tour and it was like down to four or five or something like that. And and the weather was supposed to just like snow like three feet and we we're like well should we keep you know keep going and like do we bring this guy that's wearing all cotton like you know it was just so intense but then we did it and it didn't snow three feet it just kind of like drizzled snow but it still got pretty intense and we still all had to huddle in a tent yeah to it keep did, it but it was like <laughs> when I look back I sort of don't have clear memories about that trip which was like kind of like two weeks long except for I have very clear memories about those moments and that particular section and I just feel yeah. like that's I mean when something is like kind of haunting you or like you're so apprehensive and it is gets a bit tough that's I mean nearly always turns out to be the best bit anyways right right exactly and I and you know I was riding with Ryan Brink um, a lot towards the end there. And, um, you know, I think we were talking about like, you know, it's been pretty easy, you know, it's been pretty easy until this point. And then we we're like, once we got into like Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico, we we're like, it had, it, it just got hard. Like, this is what makes this ride hard, you know, like right. it had to get hard sometime and now we're getting it. <laughs> like the weather was making it hard or the terrain also got hard. Um, I would say the terrain in Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico uh, was a bit more challenging than uh, like sustained challenge because um, you're riding at higher elevation and some of the roads were a bit more technical and it was, you know, technical for a long time. It's still rideable, but it was just really time consuming. Like you couldn't go as far um, in one day, I think that's, and that was also a challenge because I was like, oh, I should be doing like 130 miles a day. But and I was like, oh, I can only actually go 78 miles today. Like This is as far as I can go in the amount of time that I have. Um, so it, that was, that was different, but also the weather, the weather made it really hard, you know. Why do they, why do you think they call it the hardest mountain bike race in the world? Because, um, I mean, it looks lush. <laughs> <laughs> well you know like right I mean for one it's like a gravel it was very gravel yeah. like you know gravel friendly um so I'd say it's like a gravel race <laughs> but um but you know they they call it the hardest mountain bike ride in the world because it's probably the longest I mean that's an incredible distance you know anyone that's doing that you know is that's you've got to overcome so much to get even get to the beginning of that and then um to make it to the end is there's so much that you have to be able to persevere through so um and i don't know if there's anything else like this that exists you know that just like you know the average person can just sign up for and put themselves through and um yeah, that's this long, you know, it's long and it's all off, it's all off pavement, which is, I mean, there's lots of pavement, but mostly off pavement. Yeah, it's an excellent, um, it's an excellent route for everyone. Um, and it's an off road route for everyone like touring or racing, like whatever, whatever you want to do And adventure cycling does such a great job um, with, you know, they have like alternatives alternative routes mapped out so that you don't have to hit any of those technical sections. So like you can like pick and choose your own adventure 
And um, just the way they've mapped it out is, you know, they might not always take the most, I mean, they take some really, a really scenic way. Like I was really impressed by the like consistency of how scenic it was. And, um, and oh yeah, what I was going to say is just like, they, they have lots of resupply, like the resupplies are totally reasonable and um, water was was you know frequent enough and then you know in all those like big gaps of like long distances between resupplies there's always like these um good samaritans who like put coolers out at the end of their driveway with um jugs of water like little snacks like there's tons of that kind of stuff along the route as well so it's a very um accessible route and and I, you know, I did the TAT, which is a dual sport motorcycle route that goes from east to west across the country on dirt roads. And, you know, because that route is designed for dual sport motorcycles, um, they, they map the distance between resupplies based on like when motorbikes need gas. And so those distances were far greater um, between resupply than they are on the Great Divide. So I really appreciated how frequent the resupplies were. That was, you know, a lot of routes that I do, there's like no resupply for like five days. And so that's kind of like how I pack my bike and how I prepare and all that stuff. But just the fact that this was like almost every day I had a resupply. Um, it wasn't every day, but you know, you could get something almost every day. And um, that made it kind of easy in a way. Well, a lot of these questions are kind of like, you know, did you ever experience doubt and vulnerability and how'd you cope with it? Or like, did you ever feel like this is impossible? I can't do this. And how did you get past that? But it sounds like it wasn't, um, I mean, was it, are you, are you playing it off as like, oh, it's easy. And everything that's in the past is like, it's not as bad as it was. But in the, <laughs> in the moment, was it like as dramatic as we would like to think it was? <laughs> um. <laughs> You know, I would say there's just like, there were days that were really hard, you know, like the day going into Butte and then the day um, after I left um, Colorado, uh, not Colorado, Steamboat Springs. Um, you know, I had these days, I probably had those two days, which were hard days, hard days to get through. And, you know, the days after, the couple days after would be like recovery days from those those days. And then, um, and then, you know, I had the rain and the rain was kind of like a mental thing for me. Like, um, and I was just like, it was just like kind of a new challenge for me. Um, but, um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, like I said, I think, you know, you kind of, you kind of like said it in the beginning with the whole breaking of the bike, like normally on, on rides, like, there it is you know really really challenging in some some aspect but i think like that my seeing my frame broken after i had spent you know three months preparing like my whole life for this ride and to see my frame broken and just like gnarled up on the side of the road just made me sick like i was just like i you know the world was crumbling like this was my crisis moment and um and that was really intense like that night like i didn't sleep like i was just like just distraught like i didn't know and then the next day it was like a 360 degree turn like you know there are just so many people wonderful people in the cycling community um came to my aid you know in my time of need and it just like blew me away like i was like this is this is making this whole um experience happen for me i had wonderful time in bozeman and then i just felt like um, so grateful to be able to do that ride after that. Like, and I think maybe just that like gratitude and just like being, um, just kind of overwhelmed by the support and, um, you know, all the cheering on Instagram and just all of it. I just felt so grateful to be out there. So I really think that that, that moment really influenced my ride, like in that way, it must have. Ooh, everything happens for a reason style.
I guess so. Okay. All right. So we got some food questions. What was the grossest thing you ate? And did it did it seem gross <laughs> or delicious at the time? Well, you know, I ate a, a couple hot dogs here and there, probably three total. And there was one particular hot dog that I ate that I was like going in to get the hot dog. And I just had met Brian. Brian's the tall guy with dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had just met like two, 30 seconds earlier. And, um, you know, he seemed cool. I was like, cool. And um, it was like the first time I'd see, you know, I had just seen Ryan and Ryan was like the first person I'd seen in five days. So I was like, you know, oh my God, I'm with people now. <laughs> and, uh, and he's getting food at the gas station. I'm getting food at the gas station and I'm about to go in for my hot dog. And he like passes behind me and he like looks over my shoulder and he's like, Ugh. like, and then I'm like, oh. Great, but I still get the hot dog, and I eat the hot dog, and um, you know it was it was great. It was great. It was fine, but I was kind of grossed out because he, he he grossed it out. But um, <laughs> but like, yeah, the hot dogs, the hot dogs that like sort of like roll around in moisture, yeah. like those ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Well, not in mo I don't know if they're in moisture, but they they look kind of greasy and they're rolling on a little thing, and you don't know how long they've been on that thing for. And, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But then you put like a ton of mustard and ketchup and relish on them and then you eat it and it's like, it's great. I really thought I would eat more corn dogs, but I, and I would have eaten more corn dogs, but I didn't see very many corn dogs. Huh. What is a corn dog again? A corn dog is a hot dog, um, with a, like, a like a crusty outer layer. Like a corn. Yeah. Like a. Oh, I know that cornbread. Yeah. It's like cornbread on the outside. Yes, I think I, I think I don't know if I've ever had one, but I think I understand from like you know American TV what they are. Yes, yes, you probably yes. do. Okay, so you already sort of said that you did get enough food because there was resupplies all the time, and it seemed like there was plenty of water on the route as well. And like, would you, do you ever run out of water or run out of supplies in any way? Um. Yeah, so like the I I did run out of water like this the in northern New Mexico. It was like I didn't resupply at the summit and I was like, "Oh, I'll just get water down the road or something." And it was like the first time there was no water down the road. And then it was like a long it was, you know, it wasn't very long. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I didn't I didn't uh have any issues with water. You know, when it was really hot early on the ride, there was tons of water available and then i expected the big challenge to be um new mexico with no with there because there's not very many resupplies for water in new mexico and i was expecting super hot temperatures in new mexico but you know i got all the rain in new mexico and it was like 50 degrees so it's like not drinking very much water and so i didn't really have any issues with water I think um, the the food resupplies were fine. It's just the hard thing was, you know, like, you know, sometimes you're just resupplying and getting your food at a gas station, you know, and that gas stations don't have very good things to eat. And, um, and so figuring out like what to eat, what I can eat from gas stations um, and just like what I can eat in general from what's available on route because the route, these are really, really small towns. So it's usually just like a gas station and a restaurant if you're lucky. Um, and, you know, you, it just, you have to be able to get there within their hours and sometimes you're not there with the hours. So you have to just go to the gas station. But what I ended up doing is like, I would, you know, do a good resupply um, for like my like basic um, staples um, at a grocery store. And that would be like every three or four days. And then I would do like kind of snack supplemental resupplies at gas stations. So I'd get like all my sugary candy and then some like chips or something like that. And then, um, and then for like my meals, I would get just like when I go to a restaurant, I would order my dinner or my breakfast or whatever. And then I would order two extra things to go like wrapped up in tinfoil. And I just eat that for my, my meal. So that's what I ended up doing for food. 
which mm-hmm. it took me a little while to figure that out. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm going to like home make my own <laughs> bean cheese avocado tortillas like I normally do. But like, turns out that like, after you ride 130 miles, you don't really have the energy to like, you know, slice cheese and make a, make multiple burritos and stuff for yourself. It's just easier to just unwrap something and eat a, eat a cold sandwich or something like that. I guess that's what like kills some of the boredom as well. Like, like having to think forward in that way where it's like, Oh, okay. This store opens at eight. I got to get there for eight or this store closes at six. I better hustle. And like, then you've always got a bit of a task that you're heading towards. So I guess days sort of get filled up in that way. Cause did you experience much boredom or? Um, no, I didn't experience very much boredom. <laughs> Surprisingly, like, yeah, it was not boring. Like, I thought it was going to be boring, but it wasn't. You know, I was listening to um, all the Lord of the Rings, you know, and um, all the Lord of the Rings books. So that was fun and had music. And um, I would listen to podcasts sometimes, but I would mostly just listen to Lord of the Rings. And I would always have, you know, you know, always just riding you know you got places to be miles to miles to ride so it's like wasn't very bored I remember doing the Ruta del Jefe one year and it was my first sort of like ride of that length and you said just try and keep stops to a minimum and be time like um conscious and that sort of stuff did you did you like I mean obviously you would be in a little bit but you were you always rushing in and out of uh places or you were relaxed Um, yeah, I was pretty relaxed. I wasn't rushing. Um, I did keep my stops to like a minimum. I definitely wasn't chilling on the side of the road as much as I would, you know, I would, if I wanted to like take a break, I was usually taking a break, standing up on my bike, you know, or, and always making sure I was like being efficient or anything, but I never felt like I was rushing. I always like did the things I needed to do. And, um, but like, and didn't rush and, you know, I talked to people and, and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, I didn't talk to them for super long, but like, I would, I would chat with people and I wasn't like running in and out of stores. Definitely not. <laughs> Do you think that if you did have those tactics and you were a little bit more like, um, pushed, uh, do you think that you could have won the Tour Divide this year? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Maybe, but, like, I don't know if I could have sustained it, you know? Like, I don't know if I'm that motivated, you mm-hmm. know? Like, mm-hmm. it would have been to do that for that long. Like, you know, for the first, like, so day, you know, I think, like, on day two or day three, I was I was doing a bit of a chase. And, um, but then I, I just did. realized, I, I suspected, I was like, oh, <laughs> I know Sarah, <laughs> yeah, I know, I got sucked it's in, I got sucked in. I can see it's getting closer and closer. <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized, I was like, I don't want to do this for 20, you know, I don't want to do this for three weeks. Like, that's not, that's not fun. Like, I mean, I, yeah, not I- also for me like to be um lauren and to have somebody like looking over your shoulder and she would always be like oh god like if she was looking to to win i'm not sure what her mind state was but if if i was lauren and i had you wondering whether you were trying to chase me down or not that would give her such a like a level of anxiety i think like for me anyways if i had somebody like sort of tearing down behind me i just wouldn't enjoy myself and i felt sorry for lauren but i was also like yeah <laughs> well she definitely um she was definitely talking to people um telling people that she was worried about me and i would hear it through people that were in front of me or who had had been talking to her and you know i it was it was flattering but like i was also wondering if she was just doing that to like try to egg me on like get me into the get Ooh, me into the race I, you know? think it's I did think it there it could have been a strategy too you know but um but i got a kick out of that because i was like i'm having so much fun back you know i'm like I'm just like, I'm not even working very hard, you know, yeah. I was, I was working hard, but I was just, you know, I was just doing my ride. I wasn't, I, I did not mentally prepare to engage in a competition like that. And, um, 
like I didn't think that that was going to be a reality. And so um, I was not prepared to switch gears from the the gears that I had set for myself for this ride. I guess um, because this is the way that you live your life, you are a professional adventure cyclist. So you've had plenty of preparation for these sorts of things and you are like very comfortable on the bike. Um, I suppose like, you know, your mm, like easy time of it probably wouldn't be the same experience for somebody who's like a weekend bikepacker looking to get ready for this sort of thing. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a thousand ways to give advice for people like that. But do you think that this sort of thing would be achievable for somebody that is more of like a weekend overnighter, swift camp out sort of um, style bikepacker? You know, yeah, I mean, I I think it is. And I think a lot of people like that do that. Like, you know, the the longest ride I ever did before I did the tat was like a five day bike tour. Um, So, you know, like this bike tour is um, is like doing a five day bike tour, you know, three or four times or four, five times in a row, you know, like. Um, I think that there are going to be different challenges for different kinds of folks. Like for some folks, it's going to be the physical challenge. And for other folks, it's going to be the mental challenge, like being away from your loved ones for that long. Like there, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for, for different kinds of folks. Um, but yeah, like for me, um, I think what, what happened was, um, I didn't ride, more than 65 miles um, before the tour divide. Um, I didn't know even if I could ride 100 miles loaded. I didn't know that I I would be able to do that. But because I live in a place and I spend time in places and I do routes that are um, a bit more like uh, technical and um, like with more climbing uh, or um, or just more loaded. I'm carrying more stuff. I don't know what it was, but like that's that's kind of where I spend my time riding my bike. And I think that training in those places and um, yeah, also just spending so much time living on my bike. Like I know that I, I need like the self care. Like I need to go to the laundromat. I need to get a room. Sometimes I like taking showers. Like I like to be clean. Um, like I think I know all that stuff from spending so much time on my bike. So I think just all those things combined and then getting on a course that was, um, a bit more like easier than I, thought it was going to be compared to where I normally ride. Um, I think that helped me, um, Mm -hmm. all that, that kind of stuff. But like I said, it's, it's going to be different for everybody, you know, and it is different from everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just seemed like for this ride, for me this time, um, things just came together really well. I had awesome support from family, friends, sponsors, like there's so much, community involved in like helping me get through this ride that like you know that alone is a huge advantage um and um I think it really helped me really really helped me because if I was just like out there doing it by myself like you know I don't know yeah it would it'd be different but I had a lot of momentum so mm. um I'm I'm very lucky and grateful very interesting perspective. I think that's maybe something that people don't really take into account when preparing for maybe this sort of challenge. I mean, maybe some people do, but yeah, I guess it comes with experience, I suppose. I do. There is a question that I, I do really like, and now I, I at the beginning I was like, oh, this will be a great one to answer. But after listening to um, sort of your answers, now I feel like it's kind of a hard one. But Free Food Tomorrow asked, how ill prepared could you be and still actually complete it? Um, they're asking for themselves. So um, that's a hard question to answer. But yeah, it is. It is. And I, but I do like that question. And, um, but yeah, like I said, it's, it totally depends on the individual. And for me, you know, I can only speak from my experience and, the, you know, I didn't ride more than 65 miles. 
Um, but again, like that 65 mile ride that I did involved like a two mile, 2000 foot hike a bike. So, like, you know, it kind of like evens out, you know, and, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing with this is like, you really have to have your gear dialed. Like you, you need to show up to the, the race with like, you know, fully working gear, fresh components, you know, like you need everything because, you know, you're going to, it's going to break. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that on this course that could, could break it. And, um, you, you know, so that just the fact that my bike broke like three days before, like it did, um, was that makes it such a huge crisis. Cause it's like, you have to start with, a like essentially a brand new bike. And, um, so you have to have that element. And then I think you just have to be, um, really have to like organize your life just so that, you know, everybody around you like knows you're going to be doing this and, um, so, you know, supports you, you got the support, um, and love of your family and friends. And then you've got the physical aspect and just like a plan, you know, like, how are you going to take care of yourself? Like, what are you going to do if you start feeling really bad and you stop having fun? Like, are you going to quit? Or are you going to scale it back a little bit and like reevaluate what you need to do? Like, are you going to slow it down? You know, maybe get a hotel room, maybe take a day off. Like you have to have these things like thought about kind of ahead of time so that you don't judge yourself or like have a crisis in the moment, you know, on the ride. Um, but heck, you know, I'm sure so many people wing this. Like, honestly, I, <laughs> I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> It just depends on the individual. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, when we spoke the other day after you had finished your ride, I think um, you said something that I was like, this is perfect. Um, I mean, it, in my day-to-day -day living, I love to just, um, what is the word? It's a, like under-promise and over-deliver. And that's what you kind of did for yourself, which was um, you really expect very little of this whole experience. And that way you were able to crunch your goals the whole time. So you're like living on a high because you're like, look at me go. And where a lot of people probably have like the opposite where they're like, I'm going to really push myself. I'm going to achieve this. They don't. And then they have to battle their own like self-doubt and like, who am I? <laughs> what am right. I doing? Why am I here? I'm stuck at this like sort of thing so um yes. i yeah i mean that would be a huge tip to give to somebody as well like just so expect true. nothing <laughs> yeah exactly expect that you might quit you know like expect that that might be an option you know obviously that's not what you want but um but yeah i mean like i in that way you know going back to one of those other questions like in that way, I exceeded my expectations for myself throughout the entire thing. And that did give me a high. Like, that made me feel great. Whereas I was riding next to people where they're like, you know, I had this goal and I'm five days behind this goal. And, you know, like, I got to quit. You know, like, I got, I've got to get back to my family. You know, right. like, I like, got to. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I didn't say that but yeah like um you know so and that I mean I think that that really caused a lot of people to stop riding it's just their expectation for themselves and um you know maybe not exceeding that maybe not meeting that expectation and and kind yeah. of basing your whole plan off of that very uh high goal you know, it's very, that's a lot of pressure. I have wanted to like take so much pressure off of me. Like, that's why, you know, you and I were working together. Cause I was like, I don't want to deal with Instagram while I'm on this. You know, I don't want to have to do that, you know? And so that was something I did to take the pressure off. Mm. I mean, I think it's a good ethos to just live your life in general, because um, I think we put ourselves through heaps of expectations and pressure and stuff. I mean, I do it all the time. So um, even in the last six months, I've been trying to pare back just what I expect for myself and I'm happier for it. So, and I yes. achieve more because I'm, you know, don't have such like, you know, to, uh, like highs and lows of like, oh, you know, 
that wasn't what I wanted and then I quit and then, you know, have to think of another direction to take with it. I mean, this is going off topic, I guess, and I don't want to be too specific with any like particular things, but I think, yeah, I mean, just as a general rule in life, I think, you know, keep, keep, keep yourself, you know, happy and be easy on yourself so you can achieve more stuff. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's so important. I think that's, I think that's a great lesson for, from this for sure. Yeah. Okay. Not really good. Yeah. Um, well, it'd be interesting to talk to somebody that did like have the opposite, like sort of thing, like have really strict goals with themselves and, and see what their outlook or their reflection on it, because yours is so positive. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder if somebody who had the um, sort of other tactic would also be positive or whether they're probably still on that, like, you know, well, next year I'm going to do it again and I'm going to try again like <laughs> and then they caught right, it a right. little like loop of <laughs> yeah <laughs> that yeah. was interesting yeah um yeah so kind of like the last question i reckon um i mean there's plenty of questions but some of it is already answered in some videos that we've done before like preparation um yeah you know what your view of your training and stuff yeah you could definitely look back on some of your older videos and like your gear i think it would be really cool maybe in another video um to to have a reflection on how your gear did perform yeah that'd be really interesting um so maybe we could do that but this last you know yeah maybe i'll just touch on that real quick because i know that that was asked a few a few times like what were the things that i had um, that maybe I liked or, or didn't like. And I think just the biggest takeaway was, you know, because I hit so much weather, I think I probably would come back with the tent, you know, a more minimal tent. You know, the bivy kind of scared me. I was like, I don't want to camp in the rain. You know, <laughs> you don't want to do that. Um, you know, it was totally fine. It, but it was just when I would have to pack up in the rain, all my stuff would get wet. And it was like day after day getting wet. And so, um, I think, you know, at least I could pack up in the tent and keep things dry while I was packing. Um, And then the other thing. Sensation to actually feel the rain on you as well, like as you're trying to sleep. (laughs) Right, right. It wakes you up. It wakes you up. Mm -hmm. Definitely feel it. Um, The other thing was that my sleeping bag was not kept in a waterproof bag. Um, like my stuff sack on the outside of my bag was not waterproof. Um, it's water resistant, but just with the amount of rain that I was getting, all my shit was getting wet all the time. So I am definitely going to either invest in a waterproof stuff sack or just a waterproof outer pouch thing. Um, and more waterproof bags, I think is what I learned. I was like, yeah, I want the waterproof bags. Cause mm-hmm. when you, when your stuff gets wet, it's just, it makes it kind of impossible. Like I felt like I had to get hotel rooms to like dry my stuff out because I was just, everything was wet. (laughs) No nightmare really. Like, I mean, I could very easily step into like being wet all day. And uh, some of the questions we didn't really answer on like, you know, mental preparedness, but um, how did you sort of continue to be so motivated to keep going when, I mean, you're already halfway through and stuff. You, you want to keep going, but like, how do you sort of like pick yourself back up when you are sort of wet for days and it just, it's shitty. Well, I mean, I just really just made sure I was like, I, it just happened. Like I got hotel rooms a lot, like during those rainiest times, like I would ride from town to town, like for <laughs> like three days or you know, like uh, over the course of like five days, I got three hotel rooms or something. And I was drying my stuff every night. And then if I didn't have that, I was going to the laundry mat and like stuffing myself in the dryer while I ate McDonald's or something, you know, like that's what I, mm-hmm. that's what I did. So I was really, I was drying out every day. Um, it was just a matter of like, at that point, just getting totally soaked and being soaked during the day. Um, So I I kind of managed my stuff so that it wasn't always wet, you know, but if I had to sleep out and it would have been wet, like if I didn't have that option to get to a hotel room, it would have been wet. And I I probably would have quit, (laughs) you know, like that would have been really hard. 
I guess you know? like a lot of people potentially, um, not that taking a hotel room is any sign of like weakness. That's just how you continue to get through a ride. But I guess um, a lot of like uh, over mm, like exaggerating minds that are watching this race is like, oh, it's been raining for three days. They've been wet for three days. Like they uh, got a soaking, you know, clothes and gear that's such strength and mental like power but in reality it, it might not actually be that <laughs> yeah I mean it actually wasn't I mean like I there was you know the the one night that I had to camp out like double time you know when it was wet I didn't get rained on at night and my stuff was dry when I went to bed and it started raining in the morning and my stuff was wet you know, at the end. So I just lucked out, you know, during those, those evenings. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people got hotel rooms or just were able to dry out or they just had waterproof bags and it wasn't in a waterproof bag and a tent. and It wasn't an issue for them. They were like, Oh, I can handle the rain. You know, like they were just more prepared, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, for me, like, I did, you know, during that crisis in Del Norte, like where I was like scared of the weather, I was just, I said to myself, like, I'm going to finish this. And if I have to get, you know, a few more like hotel rooms than what I thought I was going to, then so be it. Like, you know, like I, I deserve to do this and I deserve to get a hotel room, you know, treat yourself. 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 Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I really, there's one question, but I really um, like sort of how approachable you've made the route seem. And because a lot of these things sort of do seem a little out of reach for, for yeah, like these weekend bikepackers and stuff. Like they want to be somebody that does an ultra endurance race. But um, I mean, the way that you've painted it, it sounds really approachable. And I think that's cool because I think some people really love to exaggerate their own journey as well. You know, like they, they sort of, focus on the drama and overhype uh, how difficult things are. When, back when I was beginning touring, I would only ever like write stories about how torturous and like painful everything was. And, it, you know, like you did sort of get the glory from people going, wow, you're amazing. And but, you know, looking back, I was just being dramatic. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Totally, totally. And, you know, I think that was something that I really um, focused on early like before the ride I kind of had a mantra as I was training that like my suffering is nothing special you know like everybody on the tour divide is going through the same thing um you know pretty much at the same time like everybody is having a similar exp experience everybody's in the elements like everybody's having that so it's a shared a shared experience so yeah it's just not nothing special like yeah if, you yeah. know everybody went through the things that I went through I'm sure in some way and probably in a lot of different ways too but like we all experienced the rain the storms um I was pretty sure that the rain and thunderstorms were pretty much following Ryan and I the longest out of everybody but you know I was starting to take things personally at that point <laughs> but uh, okay. would you do it again yeah you know. Would you do it again? <laughs> you know, I always say I'm, I'm not a per, a, the kind of person that does the same thing twice. Um, so it'd have to be in a very drastically different way if I was to do it again. What I keep telling people is like, I would, I am interested in doing these challenges, more of these challenges, um, you know, where I'm doing like a solo effort and I'm pushing myself to see, you know, how, how, Far and how fast I can go through a route, um, but while still maintaining my health and happiness and um, and enjoyment of the ride. Like I like, you know, for me, it's not like a placement. It's like achieving this like perfect balance for me, um, where it's like it's like bliss, you know. Like it's just like it's bliss, you know. There are moments out there that are just total bliss where you're just like you're just there. You're just like in this perfect balance. And that's the feeling I'm going for. And that's why I would do something like this again is to just chase after that feeling, I think. Nice. Nice answer. Okay. Well, that's kind of everything that I feel like I wanted to ask. Is there anything um, that you think that we didn't cover that you thought was important about your ride? Um, 
No, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I think I saw a question from someone who asked, who does our hair? Oh, well, um, <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to wear wigs because, <laughs> because um, I've got quite sort of fine and fine hair that um, I've always sort of struggled to to do anything with, give any proper style. And I've always wanted to wear wigs for like years. And then I thought, what a perfect way to introduce everybody to me wearing a wig. <laughs> so thanks, Sarah. Um, I just got, they're like 15 bucks I each. I got like, I got like four. I got a pink one. I got a long wow. blonde one. I got my news anchor one. This is my Sarah Swallows inspired one. So I say let's bring back that. into mainstream for white people. <laughs> They, they, it looks super natural and it looks great. I love them. They're, they're great. I, I think you look great in wigs and I think you look great without wigs too. Mm. Um, I, I, you, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? Oh, more? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, um, this was really fun and, um, your, your, <laughs> Your persona during this whole thing was was super entertaining. I'm just curious, like, have you done anything like this before? And is there um, any aspirations for, you know, maybe like a famous TikTok channel or YouTube channel or acting in your future? Like, tell tell me more about how you feel about this. Um. It's never been my desire to do any acting or anything like that. I also am a bit terrified of TikTok because for the past few years, I have really channeled like a lot of my energy into my Instagram and I'm really tired of it. And doing content for myself is boring to me, uh, but I just seem to have a lot of like, I've always had a lot of ideas that just sort of come out that I always want to execute. So. And this was a really good opportunity for me to just channel it in one direction to like all the ideas to have this one sort of purpose rather than like when I'm on my own shit, all my ideas are coming from every which way and I can't do them. So um, that's why I sort of really had a lot of fun with this is because it was like this project that lasted for a little bit longer and um, I could just daydream about all the things that I wanted to do. And I have so many things that I didn't do that I wanted to execute. But um, so, yeah, I've been really tickled by this experience because I felt like it was a much cleaner way for me to sort of like throw out my humour um yes. and i find the internet a really great space to be creative um and over the years i've sort of honed in like i've got my own ethos is like to to not be uh, afraid of public humiliation and to just lean right into it and i get to do that on the internet you know i get to uh, just embarrass myself and not care. So um, that's why I really like doing this sort of stuff because actually like my day-to-day -day sort of personality is quite, um, I mean, for the most part, it's it's quite mild. Like <laughs> uh, I can get excitable, but I tend to leave a lot of my energy out for the internet. So I love to do this sort of stuff. I love to do it as a job, which is an absolute dream um, because it allows me to sort of express myself um, and I have a lot of ideas. So in the future, I would love to continue to do these sorts of projects. So um, I have sort of lined up a couple of other things in the, for the rest of the year that are in this sort of space, like where um, I'm hired by a company to produce certain things in a certain way. And so then I can sort of place my ideas in that box rather than me just floating around like a feather on the wind, not really knowing why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. But I mean, that all got me to this stage where I now get to <laughs> do it for a job. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was just um, so refreshing. Uh, just so refreshing in so many ways. And I, I don't think I'm the only one that felt that. I think, you know, there's just so much um, serious stuff on the internet and just, uh, you know, this was just pure fun and, uh, yeah, it, you, you did such a great job. And what I liked about what you did was um, 
you know, you didn't like dwell over making things perfection, you know, like you, you were just like doing it, you're producing, you weren't spending, I mean, you spent a lot of time on this stuff, you know, but like, you know, you could be obsessing over this stuff and it would take so long and it would take longer to put out there, but you're just it's like getting it out there and that I think you know doing it that way also made it more fun and like natural and um and just refreshing because it was like we're just having fun like weren't we just saying what were we saying in the beginning of all this was that it's just going to be a fun experiment like we had we had no idea what we were going to do like we had no idea what this was going to look like <laughs> exactly and we also lived by our like what we were talking about before is like we had no expectations yes, and we just we it was just yeah. gassing each other up just being like do whatever you got to do and yeah. uh, i think that's why it was so fun you know like i yeah i think so but um right. Yeah, I mean, my special yeah. to not to not dwell too many like on too many ideas and to to drag it out because I I know that so many people would experience this sort of like loop where they can't get out of wanting to make something perfect and it not not being that way. So um, right. I just sort of shit it out and then uh, you know when I look yeah. back on it in a couple of years time, I'm like fuck that was great, but then at the time I'm like well this is a piece of shit. And so yeah. um, I just think that like my attitude towards any content that I make or somebody else makes. Um, you know, it changes over time as you look at it or like how it ages and stuff. So that's why I never dwell on, on like, you know, execution, perfection, execution, perfecting execution, right. that sort of stuff. If that was, if anyone was looking for some advice on content creation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and one last thing was just that, you know, I think another thing that we did was like, we gave each other like just total free i mean freedom you know like it was like not we're not trying to like influence each other's thing it was just like i trust you like i gave you my instagram account like you got to see all my self-help therapy <laughs> accounts that i follow you know like you got to see that like <laughs> <laughs> we're just out of a spiral that tornado i'm like oh my god like <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you you got to see that and like i trusted you and um and it felt like you trusted me and like i mean you definitely gave me a lot of direction um on what you you know you just gave me direction and i just did what i did and then you weren't like oh can you redo this you were just like this is great and just like took it and i was like <laughs> okay so like that encouraged me to do it more because it wasn't like I had to do it, do it over all the time and like perfect it. I just had to just be myself and just send it to you and you were going to make it awesome. Like, and I thought that that was really fun. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's, um, you know, that's a good review for future employers. If anyone's interested in hiring yes. me for their, their marketing manager. No, what is it? I like a, yeah, I don't know. Marketing consultant or marketing I, don't know. I, don't know. I was trying to write the description earlier and I couldn't find the words I said marketing consultant but you're more than that you're like an you're like a in stand-in influencer or something <laughs> like that stand in <laughs> well, maybe it's a new I have no idea. and I'm now in, in career, career like well. adventure cyclist yeah, you know, I, you have to make up your own name. Places. Yeah, yeah, this could be new. Well, yeah, well, thank you for allowing me to, to do this too. And thank you for trusting me. Um, I feel like we could do it again and do something equally as fun. So uh, hopefully we get to work together in the future. And if not, then at least we get to ride together in the future because I love riding. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll do. I think we're going to be doing it all. So I just can't wait. It's always fun. And, and thank you so much for doing this. It's, it's been awesome. Yeah, thank you. Well, there you have it. The untold story of Sarah Swallow and the Tour Divide. You can read more about the drugs, the lies, the cheating in my tell-all tale, Sarah Swallow, The Untold Story by Jams. Thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned till next time. I'm your host, Jambi Jambi. Good night, America.